I'm Shankar Ganesan and chair of the marketing department. And it is my distinct honor and privilege to welcome you all on behalf of the marketing department to the first Chief Marketing Officers Summit at Notre Dame. So this event is in collaboration with the Forbes CMO Summit Group. And as I was thinking about it, it's actually the perfect time to host such a conference because many in the industry have argued that marketing is entering a new golden age. CEOs are increasingly dependent on their CMOs because they need top line growth and view marketing as a critical component to help them achieve it. We are actually, we are truly honored to have a distinguished panel of CMOs and senior marketing managers share their insights and knowledge about marketing. But before I invite my our first speaker to the podium, I want to thank all the students, business executives, and alumni for participating in this event. I also want to take this opportunity to thank some of the key people who have made, who have helped us make this event possible. Um, Jennifer Rooney from Forbes. Where is Jennifer? Jen Jean Collier from Corporate Development. There is Jean. Is Carol Elliott here? Carol? She's not here. And of course, Tim Gilbride from our marketing department. Let's give him a big hand. OK, a few housekeeping issues before I continue. I want to remind you that you need to pick up your name tag uh, from the front. It is your meal ticket for tomorrow. Also, the mixer is right after the evening's presentation in the atrium. OK, so with that, let me introduce uh, Linda Boff from General Electric. Boff is GE's chief marketing officer in charge of customer experience, marketing, and branding for the company. In our role, Boff has focused on GE's transformation to a digital industrial company, intensifying GE's commercial and customer impact with software-defined machines and solutions that are connected, responsive, and predictive. She is also responsible for driving the GE brand through innovative content, digital marketing, and media partnerships. Previously, Boff was the executive director of GE's global brand marketing. She's, she also served as CMO of iVillage Properties, part of the NBC Universal. Boff joined GE in early 2003 with 18 years of experience in marketing, advertising, and communications, including senior roles at Citigroup, the American Museum of Natural History, and Porter Novelli. Boff is a recipient of many awards. Boff is a 2014 AWNY Changing the Game Award winner, B2B Magazine's 2012 Digital Marketer of Year, and 2012 Media Maven. She is on the board of Partnership with Children, um, in uh, Partnership with Children, a New York City-based organization which provides social support to 5,000 hard-to-reach school children. Boff is also on the Ad Council's Executive Committee and is a member of Digital 50. She earned a bachelor's degree in political science and psychology from Union College. So without further ado, let me welcome Linda Boff to the podium. Thank you, Professor. Um, it's really wonderful to be here. Um, this is my first trip to Notre Dame. It's my first trip to South Bend. 
Um, I've been taking pictures of the dome as quickly as I possibly can and posting them on social media. Um, and it's really a tremendous privilege to be here talking about marketing, talking about reinventing a brand as I stand in the halls of what is an incredibly iconic brand, and that is Notre Dame. A big thank you to Jenny Rooney, um, who's a friend, and just hats off for sort of doing this. Uh, it's great for the field. Thank you to Jean Collier, who uh, not only is a gift to, uh, uh, to Notre Dame, but was a longtime GE employee, so it's great to be here. So here's what I'm planning to do. Uh, I like to tell you in advance. I'll talk for 20, 25 minutes, give you a sense as to how we think about the GE brand, what we're doing. Um, reinvention is kind of the name of the game, both from a business point of view, our portfolio has changed dramatically, how we're marketing that. And then I'm gonna open it up for questions and uh, up for anything, anything you wanna talk about, anything that's on your minds that this presentation sparks or that's just on your minds in terms of marketing. So, um, you know, GE has this gift. We've been around for 124 years. I learned Notre Dame has been around for 174 years. We both have these odd anniversaries next year together, we're 300. Um, and the great thing about being around for a long time is that you establish the brand. And GE is a brand that is one of the top 10 brands in the world. We're worth $42 billion, according to uh, companies like Interbrand. Um, so that's a real honor. But what comes with that is some perceptions. So, you know, I have a few of them up here. Um, huge industrial company, accurate. Um, slow moving conglomerate, not accurate, but I could see how people might get that idea. When you have 300,000 employees, when you operate in 180 countries, um, when once upon a time we owned a real diverse portfolio that included NBC, it included GE Capital, it included appliances. I joke that when I first joined the company a decade or so ago, or um, our press release boilerplate would say GE is an industrial financial services and entertainment company. You know, not exactly focus. Um, today, we're a company that's about three things, energy, transportation, and healthcare, three industries, and all about the data and analytics around that, which we'll talk about. So there's sort of, you know, not necessarily an understanding of who GE is today. Um, generationally, I think that's particularly true. You know, perhaps there's a sense that GE was once in your kitchen. GE Appliances was sold to hire a Chinese company last year. Um, so that's a misperception. And we don't have many consumer touch points. Once upon a time we did, the company began with a lot of consumer touch points. Today there are fewer. So, you know, we need to shift perception. And the most important reason we need to shift perception is because the company is completely different. Um, I don't believe it's ever a good idea to shift perception um, if all you're doing is shifting perception and there's no reality behind it. That's bad marketing. Good marketing is about taking a value prop and actually creating that around what the company is about. So today, um, we're a company that is in the three industries I mentioned. Um, our chairman, Jeff Immelt, um, says, and I believe him, good career move, that he has bought and sold $100 billion worth of assets in his 15-year tenure. Maybe the only CEO to have done something like that. That's massive. Um, we're making a big bet on what we call being a digital industrial company. Um, what that really means is we're a company that manufactures, we make things, and we connect those things. And we do it so that our customers, our industrial customers, those that are endemic, so you know, rail yards, aviation, um, energy power plants can be more productive, and so that un other industries can be more productive. We're making a really big bet on that. Um, we're hiring software engineers. Uh, we're hiring data scientists, computer scientists like nobody's business. We hope to hire a fair number from here. Um, we're competing hard for that talent. Um, but that's not something people are really aware of. So we, as we market the company, we need to tell the story of the company in a modern way. We need to walk the walk in terms of being a digital industrial company, and that means using the tools in order to tell that. Um, we need to have this startup mentality. Culturally, that's huge, and again, we can talk about that if that's interesting to you. Probably the hardest part in some ways of our journey, and the last piece, is shifting the culture to be faster, to be more agile, 
to be okay with failure, not failure of jet engines. There we still really love Six Sigma, we want them up in the sky. But failure when it comes to um, trying new things, new business models, new opportunities. You know, right now one of the things I'm quite involved with or our team is quite involved with is, is um, industrial digital commerce. We're trying to figure out what, it's, what it means to go direct to our customers rather than always through channel partners. We're gonna fail some of the time. We're gonna stand up sites. They're not always gonna work. So that's a new kind of mentality for us. Um, this DNA of invention. So, um, you know, GE is a company that has always been about inventing and experimenting. It goes back to our very famous founder, Thomas Edison. It's great to have a famous founder named Thomas Edison. That's a great license to do business. Um, and we've pulled that DNA of invention into how we market. Um, we have a passion for science and technology, and we're very proud of that. Um, we don't kind of sit around and say, wow, how do we make jet engines cool? How do we make wind turbines something that people really will get excited about? We think those are things that are cool. We think locomotives are amazing. So our job is to kind of pull the curtain back and reveal those things. And sometimes that's an Instagram shoot off the coast of Block Island where GE put the first offshore wind turbines in North America. Sometimes it's inviting um, YouTube science stars to come up to our research center and see our experiments and film them in slow motion, which we did with the slow-mo guys. So you know, it's always about connecting to science and tech. Um, we're a company that is constantly in motion. I would say if there's a theme that has um, allowed us to still be here 124 years later, because that's really hard. I mean, clearly Notre Dame has done it. Got 50 years on us. Um, but there are a lot of companies that have not done it. We all know them, right? There's the Kodaks. There's the, um, um, God, I can't even remember their name. Who came before Netflix, where you had to go and get uh, blockbusters? Wow, right? How many videos did I rent at Blockbuster? That's not a good sign. So this idea of constantly reinventing is part of our DNA to become a digital industrial company. So I love this quote. This is um, Tom Edison. I don't think he's become Thomas Edison yet. He's young here. Um, and you know, this quote of the value of an idea lies in the using of it. That's core GE. You know, the essence of our brand is imagination at work. Once upon a time, we called that a tagline. I'm not sure I believe in taglines anymore. I think taglines are sort of, um, there's some great ones, but I think today we're in a more iterative time, but imagination at work describes who we are as a company. It's having an idea and putting it to work, which I think is what you see here. So, you know, at GE, you come to work to, to, you come to, work to solve tough things. It's this weird, almost um, hair shirt kind of thing. You know, we don't want to work on little things. We want to work on helping to provide electricity to the billion people around the world that still don't have it. We want to work on speedier locomotives. Self-driving cars, self-driving locomotives. What's next? We want to work on bringing healthcare to remote parts of Africa, China, India, and for that matter, the US. So to work at GE is to really like this idea of solving tough problems. And at the same time, and I think this is, you know, from, from what I read and your wonderful speakers tomorrow, kind of a theme of this CMO summit, it's about being personal, right? Because being big isn't enough. You know, being big is an advantage at times and an, a disadvantage at times because you need to connect with people. And our customers are people. I don't love the phrase B2B. Hey, Jim. Um, it's nice to see a friendly face. Um, because our customers are humans. I prefer B to H. Our customers don't log on to a different internet at night. They don't want an experience that's less good because we're GA. You know, the high water mark is Amazon. Amazon Prime, if you're in my family, probably a lot of yours. The high water mark is Uber. The high water mark is frictionless. So for marketers, you know, our rallying cry needs to be, how do you create great customer experiences that are deeply human, that touch people? Um, we talked about this constantly reinventing. We're a brand in motion. Um, to work at GE is to like speed. 
To work at GE is to like the idea that's ahead of you better than the idea that's behind you. I think that defines marketing in many ways. I think for people in this room, whether you're students of marketing here at Notre Dame, whether you're grad students, uh, whether you've chosen to make your profession that way, I think we all like that a little bit, right? You know, we don't want to have the same day every day, the same week, the same hour sometimes. Um, so I talked about this before. Um, at GE, we think a lot about how do we appeal to the audiences who are going to share what we love, and that's science and tech. So we're not looking to necessarily appeal to 100 million people. We'd rather find the people who are going to be as passionate about science and tech as we are. So I'm, I'm going to walk over here because I'm going to show you a video. Um, and I, what I've tried to do here is to just kind of quickly pull together some of the ways that we've embraced science, technology, innovation. And I'll talk about it afterward. But I think, uh, I think you'll get a sense of what I mean as we play this. Oh, look, this is going to work. <laughs> by an extraterrestrial. there, but I'm going to draw out a few things, or a panoply, are you okay? Can you hear me? I feel like I'm echoing. No? Okay. Um, a panoply of different platforms from virtual reality, augmented reality, podcasting, a number of different platforms, Micmac, Snapchat, uh, Twitter, Instagram, and a lot of ways that we reached out and borrowed equity whether you saw John Urschel. Does anybody know who John Urschel is? Come on, guys, it's a football school. OK, he's, uh, he plays football for the Baltimore Ravens. He's what they call a mathlete. So he's got his PhD in mathematics. So we invited John to join us on the night of the NFL draft. Um, he took over our Snapchat account. And he proceeded to dissect the draft using math and statistics. So look him up. He's pretty cool. Um, you saw Bill Nye, who we invited in as we put together a periodic table of emojis. Um, you saw YouTube creators. So for us, this is a journey into how do we connect and stay relevant and contemporary by connecting cultural relevance, technology, innovation. So, you know, we talked about, I mentioned this uh, in the video, we take a lot of pride in being the very first one on platforms. We feel like it's strategic because it's part of our DNA. Edison invented, we were the first, 
to create MRIs. We were the first to innovate in jet engines, in locomotives. So why not in marketing as a way to remind people what our business is all about? So we've been on Instagram for five years, I think more than five years at this point. Um, terrific feed, I recommend looking at it. Um, we were the first brand on Vine. We went on Snapchat uh, with Buzz Aldrin um, when we invited him to take over our account. Actually, it was to start our account. At that point, there wasn't much to take over. And uh, we had created a, a sneaker for, to commemorate the moon landing because GE materials had been in the original moon boot. So we invited Buzz to sort of put on the new sneaker since he had put on the very first moon boot. So, you know, we look for opportunities to be early on these platforms. For us, it's a, it's a competitive advantage. I mean, first of all, just really practically speaking, you're gonna get organic growth that you're not gonna get later on. You're gonna get earned media that you're not gonna get later on. But most importantly, you're gonna get experience. You're gonna be the one figuring it out versus being on the sidelines and saying, huh, I wonder why there's so many young people on Musical.ly. You gotta be on them to understand them. I still don't understand Musical.ly though. Um, this, this, this is some of our uh, imagery from our Instagram feed, something I'm really proud of. I'm also proud on this one that the way we decided to go up on Instagram was a young person on my team, Katrina Craigwell, had been at our company, I don't know, a month or two. She came to me and said, you know, there's this platform called Instagram. And at that point, five, six years ago, it was still quite new. And she asked for a few bucks to experiment and to go hire a photographer and shoot our machines and really reveal the majesty of our machines, which are not out in plain sight most of the time. And it really turned out to be a great thing. Now we do Insta walks regularly. Um, we've got a terrific feed. Um, I'd say this next idea is one of our secret weapons, if you will, though I don't obviously think it's so secret because I talk about it all the time. And that is showing up in a way that's unexpected. So just as we talked about in the beginning, you perceive GE a certain way, I think. Um, we're working on it. I think now there is a much greater perception of us as an innovative technology-oriented company. But nonetheless, any time that we can show up in a way that is um, a surprise, a delightful surprise, to be human, to be humorous, um, sometimes to be a little self-deprecating, we sort of reintroduce the company. So I'm going to show you, a, it's the only other video I have. Um, it's one some of you may have seen. I'm proud of the fact that it's run during Notre Dame games on NBC. Can't say that to every audience, so this is a good one. Um, and uh, what I'd ask you to keep in mind as you watch this, even if you've seen it already, is the idea behind this campaign um, was not how do we recruit people to GE? Even though we're quite interested in recruiting people to GE, it was how do we take a concept of digital industrial? GE is the digital industrial company, which is a mouthful, right? It's a mouthful. And explain it in English and do it in a way that people can relate to in a very simple, simple way. So this is what we wound up doing. One sec. Proud of you, son. GE, manufacturer. Well, that's why I dug this out for you. It's your grandpappy's hammer, and he would have wanted you to have it. It meant a lot to him. Yes, GE makes powerful machines, but I'll be writing the code that will allow those machines to share information with each other. I'll be changing the way the world. You can't pick it up, can you? Go ahead. He can't lift the hammer. It's OK, though. You're going to change the world. Surprise! <laughs> you heard you got a job as a developer. Uh, it's official. I work for GE. What? Wow. Yeah. Okay. Guys, I'll be writing a new language for machines, so planes, trains, uh, even hospitals can work better. This is... Oh! Sorry, I was, I was trying to put it away. Got it on the key. So you're gonna work on a train? Not on a train, on trains. You're not gonna develop stuff anymore? No, I, I am. Do you know what GE is? So what's your news? Uh, I got a job. I'll be programming at GE. Oh, I got a job, too. At Zazzy's. 
The app where you put fruit hats on animals? I love that. Guys, I'll be writing code that helps machines communicate. I just zazzied you. <laughs> Look at it. Oh! Uh, I can do dogs, hamsters, guinea pigs, you name it. I'm gonna transform the way the world works. I program that hat, and I can do cassava melons. I'll be helping turbines, power cities. I put a turbine on a cat. Oh. I can make hospitals run more efficiently. This isn't a competition. <laughs> So, uh, Denise, who you'll meet uh, later on and tomorrow, uh, tremendous CMO, uh, uh, who you'll be hearing from, and I were talking about this earlier. And um, when a campaign works, it's as though, like, the seas have parted, right? And you feel so good. And um, we have tried to get so much mileage out of this because it's hard, trust me, to have a campaign really hit. Um, we have taken Owen, who's the name of the character, not the name of the real person, um, around to our plants. He came and spoke to our leaders at our big leadership meeting in Florida. He came out on stage as a surprise with the hammer, handed it to our CFO, which was kind of funny if you know our CFO. Um, he um, uh, has just sort of become an icon around the company. When he joined one of our meetings, um, Henry Kissinger had been at the same meeting earlier in the evening, and the line to meet Owen and take selfies was like, so much longer than the line for Dr. Kissinger. And look, I mean, I, I do eat my own dog food, but come on, like Dr. Kissinger? This guy's like an improv actor. Um, we have uh, adapted this campaign um, in French with an actress named Sophie. So it's running in France. We have another one in China with Zhao Fei. Uh, same idea, but you know, obviously culturally relevant. We'll be doing it in India, Germany, probably South Africa. So um, as I say, this was not a campaign about recruiting, but recruiting's up 800% since we introduced it last fall. So that's, it's good when stuff goes well, right? We can tell, tell lots of stories about when things don't go well. But I would say the lesson here isn't, look at us, this is great. The lesson is, tell a story simply, be human, find something that's a bit of a stigma. In this case, the stigma was going to work for GE as a software developer. Who would do that? And being a little bit humorous, you know, taking a page out of 30 Rock humor. And I think it made us that much more approachable. So just a couple more slides and I'll open it up for questions. These are the sneakers, the moon boots that I talked about earlier. We created these, uh, it was a great partnership with a company called uh, Jack Threads Thrillist. Uh, we actually made them. The idea here was not just to remind people that GE had been part of the moon landing, because that's sort of rear view mirror. It was to actually promote our new super materials. So these sneakers have GE silicon fibers. They're really sort of a journey into the future. We put them on sale on the anniversary of the moon landing for $196.69, because 1969. Um, they sold out in seven minutes. They were on eBay. I think the last time I saw them, they were $7,000. So I said before, so if anybody gives you a pair, hold on to them. Um, I said before, you can't put GE in your pocket. And it's true, you know, we are in many industries that are invisible. If the lights went out right now, maybe you would think about energy. But most of the time, you're kind of comfortable. You're hot, you're cold, you adjust the temperature, your flights take off on time, things get to the grocery store. So how does a company that's so invisible be visible? So every now and then, sort of poking out our head and reminding people in a tangible way like this, but talking about what we're doing can be a great way to stand out. You know, we talked about this a little bit before, but I think as we transition into a company that is digitally focused with a strong analytical bent, the humanity is all the more important because all of a sudden it doesn't seem so human anymore, right? It's machines talking to machines. Well, it's not machines talking to machines. There's a very human component, but nonetheless, we have to remind people. Um, this is just a fun one. I mentioned this before, but I just thought uh, I have the world's, like literally the world's best team, and uh, they come up with great ideas. This was a way to talk about chemistry. Um, I failed chemistry at least once, maybe twice. Um, so to me, having a periodic table of emojis would have been a big help. Um, I, you know, I sort of put this up here because 
it, it is our formula. You know, when we think about marketing, it's a simple way to think about it, and certainly when we think about brand marketing and storytelling, for us it's about being first on platforms, not for the sake of being first, but because it matches who we are in our DNA, and it's a way to talk about the company. Um, activating unlikely audiences, new audiences, in an unexpected way. Finding the human, particularly as we migrate and pivot into this digital world, and then just kind of continuous motion. Um, my last slide is something that um, I, I put in here, even though I spent a lot of time talking about digital. This was a project we did last fall, and uh, it's an interesting one in that it was kind of traditional. We did a six-hour series on Nat Geo, National Geographic Channel, called Breakthrough. Um, the reason I put it in here is I think storytelling, marketing, finding your purpose, finding out how to express it, comes in all different forms. It can be a six-second science experiment on Vine. It can be a photo. It can be a tweet. Or it can be six hours of programming. And in this case, we got excited at the idea of inviting some of the very best storytellers in Hollywood, Ron Howard, Paul Giamatti, Angela Bassett, to each take on a topic of science, robotics, neurology, AI, and put an hour show together. And that's what they did, and it had a global premiere of 100, in, 180, in 180 countries. The thing I'm actually the most proud of here is that this is about where the media model is going, at least in my opinion. Um, which is places that we can never imagine. You know, when Twitter is live on Thursday night football, is it Thursday night? It's Thursday, yeah. So once again, um, and 314,000 people tune in every minute, that's a signal of what's to come. It doesn't mean that people are giving up their 62 inch television screens to watch football. I'm not. But it does mean that things are changing. So in the case of Breakthrough, when we got together with Brian Grazer and Ron Howard, this wasn't a sponsorship. This wasn't branded content. This was GE and their company, Imagine Entertainment, going 50-50 on how do we create content that people might be interested in consuming? How do we co-produce this? And oh, by the way, Who's the partner we should find to do this? And together, we went to Nat Geo and said, would you like to air this? So um, conventional and not conventional all at the same time. So with that, I'm going to conclude the me talking portion of this and uh, invite questions, um, thoughts, anything that, uh, anything that you have on your mind. And Tim will keep us honest on the amount of time we have. So questions? Yes, and maybe just say who you are if you don't mind. Uh, Patrick, uh, Patrick Convoy, uh, Notre Dame 86. Uh, wonderful work, and I love the uh, imagination at work line. I was wondering how difficult it was to get this vision shared by someone like the CFO with the hammer. <laughs> how difficult it is to get it shared across the company? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So um, uh, uh, hard and easy is the answer. So um, a couple of us were talking about this earlier. I think one of the hardest things in marketing, marketing communications, is, um, is getting the internal buy-in. It's really hard. I, I don't know how other people feel um, who are sort of out in the, in the professional world, but I think getting the people who you work with every day on board, not because they don't want to be, just because there's so many things going on can be quite difficult. Um, and you know, a lot of people have worked at GE for decades in manufacturing. So to all of a sudden wake up and say, well, today you work for a digital industrial company, and we're hiring hundreds, thousands of software engineers, and the product you've worked on is now going to be connected, and we're going to continue to sell it, but we're going to sell it a little bit differently, that's hard. Um, the easier part is GE as a company, and Gene and Tony and other people who know GE well can attest to this, that does pretty well when we pick a direction. You know, we kind of like to say, you know, we put our foot on the gas and the car runs. So I don't want to say that it was easy because internal is hard, but we're sort of set up in a way that we're pretty good at cascading information. Okay. Yeah. 
Hi, I'm Martha France, and I'm a 91 grad, um, and I'm an engineering grad, and now in marketing. Um, and I'm wondering, since you are marketing at a high-tech company, do you at some point have to strike a balance between the personal and human message and get down to a layer where your marketing is more at the technical level, and how do you balance that? Yeah, that's a great question, and it reminds me of something I was going to say earlier, so double thanks. So we think of our marketing, again, at least the brand storytelling side of our marketing, in three tiers. Tier one is um, fall in love with GE. It's storytelling. It's content that hopefully makes your heart beat a little harder. Um, it's, it's truly, and we stole this, Jim, from Google Creative Labs, um, which is this idea of fall in love with the company. Um, that's tier one content. Tier two is all about how do we take our big initiatives, um, software, electrification everywhere, uh, what we're doing in life sciences, and tell those stories. And those are, I, the way I would characterize them is there are more, um, there are more details, <laughs> there, are more fact, there are more facts in there. Um, the audience target is more specific. It might be to the oil and gas industry, it might be to healthcare. But hopefully, that doesn't mean that they're boring and dull. It means that they're still interesting, they're still unexpected, they're still human, but they're harder hitting. And then tier three is quite transactional, right? I mean, it is really about how do we put out content that's gonna generate leads. So that's kind of how we think about it. Good. Yeah, uh, uh, over here. You can just talk. <laughs> My name's Alex, I'm a first year MBA student. Um, I come from uh, the agency world, PR, marketing. Which agency? Uh, Pleasure Miller. Nice. Um, so I'm curious what you mentioned with the TD app, if you're measuring success. Yeah. Um, just overall, whether it's you know, based on the campaign or just overall, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's great. So the question was about KPIs and measurements. So, you know, look, it's kind of ironic, and you're going to hear from Jim Lozinski tomorrow, and he'll, I'm sure, talk about this. You know, we've never been able to measure more, and yet measurement somehow is eluding all of us to some degree. So it's kind of crazy, right? Um, that being said, so we have upper funnel, mid funnel, lower funnel metrics. So upper funnel, our brand matters a lot. One of the first things I said when I came out here was what's our brand valued at for, for globally, $42 billion. It's not because it's fun to be on inner brands chart, although it's really fun to be on inner brands chart uh, when you're in that level, um, although Google's pushing higher and higher. Um, it's a license to do business. 25% of the purchase price of any of our products, roughly speaking, is because of our brand. We are out there selling a new industrial operating system called Predix, software that enables industries to put big amounts of data very securely in the cloud. Our license to do that is because we're GA. So the upper funnel, sorry, I'm taking too long on this. The upper funnel metric's super important. Um, but as we get further down the funnel on digital, we look at all kinds of engagement. I'm still, I, I don't know, it'll be interesting tomorrow's dialogue. I still think there's imperfect measurements on engagement, although I think they're getting better. Shareability to me is always a good one. Video completions is always a good one. Three seconds, we can debate whether that's a good one or not, which is Facebook's metric, although they've had some challenges of late. Um, and then as we get further down, it's leads. You know, it's are we generating leads? So, you know, all along the way we measure. Sure. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I think that was late last year, early this year, that I listened to GE podcast, The Message. And you said earlier that you want people to fall in love with GE, but The Message is actually a scary podcast about technology. So I would just like to uh, ask you, what's the thinking behind that message? Yeah. And by the way, I love that podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so uh, the, the question refers to the, our podcast. It was called The Message. Um, it, it, uh, we put it on air last uh, November, December. Um, it was really good. It got to number one on iTunes. In fact, it only got knocked off when Serial uh, re-released their next season. And the team is super proud of it and should be. And we'll have season two, which will be a completely different storyline coming out in a month or two. Um, so yeah, it was kind of scary, right? It was a little dystopian. Um, uh, but it was still, at its core, about scientific storytelling. And I think it's a good point, what I said about falling in love. Um, sometimes you make an emotional connection, 
And that is as important as whether you're putting a big smile on somebody's face or whether they're saying, oh my god, I can't believe this. So the emotional connection is really important to us. In this case, it was a different kind of emotional connection, but I'm really glad you loved it. What else? Jenny. Um, awesome presentation. Um, you, for those of in the room who don't know, you're known personally as a CMO who is um, incredibly unique in the fact that you're able to take risks, careful risks, vis-a-vis -vis the platforms, the people, the agencies, the resources that you um, work with. I mean, you work with such a plethora of um, resources. Talk a little bit about what informed your willingness to take those risks and to really be bold with some of the choices you've made. You and I have talked about a lot of those things over the past. That's great. Thank you so much. Thanks for the comment and the question. So I'd say a couple things. Um, so um, as the professor mentioned, I spent a couple years at a company called iVillage. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because my guess is, particularly if you're an undergrad, you probably don't know what iVillage is. And I don't want to know that, so I'm not going to ask you. Um, but iVillage was one of the original pure play digital companies, sort of going back to the days of AOL. And it was a site, for, it was sort of a portal, all things women, health, beauty, fashion, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, I was there at a point that uh, NBC had just purchased iVillage and didn't really know what to do with it. Um, MySpace, remember MySpace, had been purchased by uh, Rupert Murdoch for about the same price. They were both about $600 million. So I went there, there's this, I really am answering Jenny's question, and I sort of was surrounded by people that were all digital all the time. And I'd had some experience, but, but I really didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what search marketing was. I, I, I sort of was like a babe in the woods. And um, uh, they took me under their wing, you know, considering I had a team, they were teaching me. And I kind of fell in love with um, what iVillage was, which was, at that point, I know this sounds insane now, but true two-way engagement. You know, we used to say social network before social networks. It was people on creaky old message boards, sort of banging on each other and saying, I've got this issue, what about you? So I came back to GE after that, GE corporate, and sort of this early weird version of the job I'm in, with this idea that um, we could do better. And um, I had been exposed to people that thought differently. So to re-enter the corporate world with that was kind of a gift. And I started assembling people from the outside. We had like this little digital advisory board. I spent a lot of my time externally with startups, with um, uh, uh, all kinds of different media companies, tech companies. But I think, Jenny, it gave me sort of this view that I brought back in. So I'd say that's the first thing. The second thing, very briefly, is I have leadership support. And that's everything. I mean, I work for a vice chairman who used to have my job. He was really, really good at it. <laughs> um, named Beth Comstock, um, who is all about what's new, what's next. I work for a chairman who, as I said, has pivoted this company. And while I promise you we don't sit around and talk about Snapchat strategy, Jeff is very, very proud of how we have reinvented communications in a way that appeals to new generations, that appeals to people that he wants to have think of GE differently. So support from the top. Um, sometimes not knowing better, right? And and you know, I learned along the way that uh, we didn't really have time to kind of wait for um, our wonderful legal department to give us a view on Vine. You know, by the time that happened, Vine would have already been gone. So we just, you know, we just started trying things. And then I hired rock stars. And I was smart enough to let them do their job. So thank you. What else? Yeah, up there. You. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hi. No, I'm okay. Sorry, I can protect. Uh, I think you can. My, uh, my name is Matt Walsh. I'm a graduate of 2001. I came up. Uh, Hello. Oh. Hello. Uh, uh, came up through the agency world as well, RGA and Crispin, before starting my own shop a few years ago. Nice background. Oh, thanks. Um, but I was really curious for GE what the intersection is between product design and marketing. Because certainly a lot of what you had up there was communications. I know you have a wildly mass market to talk to that communications helps with. But I'm just wondering where the yeah. beginning and end is yeah, of a great question. that intersection. Um, 
In fact, uh, Tony and I were together yesterday talking a lot about this. So, you know, GE is, is um, going through this uh, really fantastic effort to re-examine product management um, with an eye toward a company that has been very engineering focused and still is. But you might even say sort of run by engineers in many ways and finance and saying, you know, what, what, has, uh, what we've done before in terms of creating a product blueprint and toll gating it but not really getting any market-backed information may not be the best way forward. And I think we've been helped by some things we've started to do, like a lot of companies, we've memorized Eric Reese's you know, um, Lean Startup book. We, um, we've sort of formed this idea called FastWorks inside the company, which is about um, creating MVPs, minimally viable products, that's about pivoting, persevering, um, fast failure, and we're pulling that in now to product. Now look, every product is different. Um, we don't want to fail fast on a jet engine. You don't want us to fail fast on a jet engine. Um, but what's really fascinating is as we develop software, the mentality is completely different. So this product I referred to before, Predix, this industrial operating system, we're on version 1.0. Um, it's not perfect. You know, we're already thinking about 2.0, 3.0. We're iterating as we go. We've released numerous versions of it even since February. So I think that um, product management, product marketing is coming much closer together. But it's, it's taken a little time because I think when engineering has the role that it's had at GE and will remain that way, and engineering is a core of what we do, you know, sometimes when you're in the kind of long cycle businesses we're in, and it's years to bring out a product, you can forget, oh, by the way, the market might change over the course of five years. So I think we're getting better at it. What else? Yes. Hi, Mark Matheson, Executive MBA 14. Uh, I'm with a legacy firm, uh, Abbott Laboratories, 128 years, diverse healthcare company. Uh, you guys almost bought my division back in 2008. Uh, anyway, uh, we have a lot of business units uh, and they always want to have autonomy on their messaging to their customers, and it's not unlike your organization. So what I'm trying to understand is, how do you balance uh, a business unit's message and value proposition to its customers versus the overall yeah. corporation value? In your case, do the business units go to market with a different, under a different brand name? Yes, yeah. quite often. Yeah, so I think it's harder for you than it is for me. Um, we go to market as GA. Uh, we no longer go to market as NBC, so that was an easy one. Took that one off the off the plate. Um, so you know we're a complete branded house. There are no divisions that are not GE. In fact, you know the the interesting challenge for us because we're acquisitive is when we acquire a company. Um, for instance, our oil and gas business, largely built by acquisition, there can be a lot of um, heart for holding on to those names. Um, and you know we've got a pretty good name. You know, geez, not bad. So you know you have those dialogues of you know do you retain a, a name? How do you sort of transfer it over? So um, so I think it helps us that we go to market as GE everywhere around the world, 180 countries. Um, we're set up in a way that um, we've got marketers and communicators in all of our businesses. Um, we're uh, I don't want to say we never go off message. We do. Um, but I think we've come a long way, and I'd say there are a couple reasons. I think the focus of the company has gotten tighter. That's helped us. When we had you know, all kinds of different businesses, I think that was a harder thing. I think people went off script more frequently. I, I think for us as well, we've gotten a, a lot better on message consistency. So I speak inside the company a, a fair amount. In fact, I, I sort of you know, up that recently. And I honestly feel like I, I see what's coming out of my mouth and I think, I've said this 150 times, and how could anybody be interested in it anymore? And I've come to realize that it's like that 151st time that people might start to let it sink in. It goes back to like how hard it is to, to, to move things internally. So I think consistency, you just gotta keep driving those messages. Um, and I'd say the final thing is um, sometimes tension can be a good thing. So you know there are plenty of times we're talking to healthcare or energy or transportation, and they're saying, well, no, this is the kind of message we want out there. And we're saying, well, that's good for healthcare, but is it good for big GA? And in that, there's there's tension, but I'm not sure it's a bad thing. Uh, yes, over here. Hi, my name's Jim, 
Um, and my question pertains more to the management of the three generations within the workplace now, right? Boomers are retiring at a clip of 1,000 a day. Um, you have millennials and Xers. How do you see that landscape shifting within GE, and how do you effectively manage that? It's a great question. Um, well, I can only speak to how I manage it, um, and I'll give you a couple thoughts on, on overall. So I relish it. I really do. I, uh, my team is um, largely millennial, some, I guess, a few scattered boomers like me. I think I'm a boomer in there. Um, and then, you know, a couple others. But, um, so I lean into it because I feel as though I certainly am not a digital native. I learn a lot from my team. I have some reverse mentors. I currently have one um, who's helping me with finance. You know, I know finance, but I, I want to get sharper on it. So I asked somebody who's 25 and in our investor relations group to help me with that. So I kind of love it. Um, I think the, the question is probably more relevant across GA um, than in a world that I control. Um, you know, we are, um, <laughs> we're working on it. Um, Jeff has a, uh, Jeff Immelt, our chairman, has a Global New Directions group. So um, these are people that are probably uh, seven years or so into their career, call it seven to 10 years. Jeff has dinner with them, maybe six, four, six times a year. Um, they truth tell, which is not super easy. You know, it's really hard to, like, the higher you get up, the less people tell you the truth, right? Um, they wrote a section of our annual uh, letter, uh, which is unbelievable. They came to our big leadership meeting in, in uh, uh, Boca Raton, sat on a panel, and told us what was wrong with us. So, you know, so I think that's some of it. A couple other things we're trying to do is just operate at marketing speed. You know, um, uh, GE is famous for its processes. Well, we're getting rid of a lot of them. We got rid of ratings and reviews. We don't do our annual session C people review. We now have this, I'll show you guys at the cocktail party if you want. We do real time feedback. Um, so I walk out of a meeting and I've got this little tool and I can say, hey, Tony, you did a great job or whatever. So, you know, we're using tools to change behavior. Um, changing a culture takes a long time. Changing behavior, I think, doesn't take a long time because if you say to people, you can only use Slack or we're getting rid of our intranet, we're gonna have a, an app instead, then things start to happen pretty quickly. So I don't know, I'm not sure that fully answers it. Those are some things. So a couple more questions and then we can all get a drink and talk more. Yes? As a proxy for team communication, how do you balance protecting what is proprietary information um, and pulling back the curtain to the consumer to have rich content that's exciting for them? I probably lean more um, on um, opening up. I mean, and I've had, talk about leading into tension. I've had this discussion with others, so, um, and I haven't always uh, come out on the positive side. So at one point, we had this great idea, which was to fly drones through our factories. It actually turned into this wonderful thing called Drone Week, where for five days, we sent drones around and had our interns doing like sort of cub reporting, it was great. But the first time we tried to do this, a business that I probably shouldn't name, um, their head of engineering said no. He said, you can't do that. I'm not gonna let you show our competition what's inside our factory. And I sulked and brooded, and then I just went on and went to the next business. Um, so it still exists. I, I, look, every company has IP. Every company has things that obviously are, are confidential. I think sometimes we can make the mistake of thinking that things that, are, things that we have are more precious than they are. And I often feel the risk of not talking about something or the risk of not being on a platform is a higher risk. I'll give you a really quick example. I mentioned we're working very hard on digital commerce. You know, we, we made the decision in a course of two weeks to just start throwing some, some products, parts up on eBay. See what happens. Some people said, oh my God, you're gonna tell them the price? I Meanwhile, well, we weren't selling any of them. So what's the difference if they know the price? Yes, in pink. Your title for the customer experience. Yeah. I'm curious with everything you're doing in all of these channels, how are you ensuring, sorry, how are you ensuring that the customer is experiencing the brand in the way that you aspire for them to? Yeah, it's a great question. So I've, I have somebody on the team who spent most of the last year focused on customer experience. And um, I think we've come out in a couple places. One is it can't be theoretical. 
You know, I mean, we've talked to so many people. We've done journey maps up the wazoo. And I think that, at least for us, I've come to believe that prototypes are in some ways the best research we can do by actually creating something and seeing how the market reacts. Having said that, what we're trying to think about is less friction, right? Same kind of uh, comment I made before about Amazon Prime, right? How do you do something in one click? How do you put the burden on us, not on our customers? Um, how do we um, uh, make sure that we're delivering on time with delight? So we're trying to build those triggers in, but I think in the year we've been working on it, um, and we're trying to come up with some KPIs. You know, like everybody, NPS is, you know, everybody's you know, net promoter score is everybody's favorite KPI. I, I, I'm sure I'm not the first one to say, I don't think NPS is perfect, right? So what do you start to measure? So we're kind of asking that, but we're also prototyping a lot. So I think I'm at zero minutes. So um, I can't thank you guys enough. I mean, it's just such an honor. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Jen to be here, to get a chance to talk to you, to be at Notre Dame. So let's go have a drink and talk some more. Thank you. Thank you.